So let me ask you this out of the gate. What is your favorite personality inventory or profiling convention? Don't put it in the chat unless you want to. You can do whatever you want. But uh, what is your favorite? So is it, I'm just going to name a few, a few possibilities. Strengths Finder, uh, the Myers-Briggs, the DISC, the Enneagram. We all have our pet profiles, our favorite, right? Some that we've had a good or a bad experience with. <laughs> um, and I have this question, like, why do we like them? I think is important. Like, why are we drawn to them? What is it about these tools that, that draws us in? So here are a few ideas. Uh, first of all, they label us. Um, we love shortcuts and simplifications. I think we, we are drawn to, uh, as, uh, as another friend of mine that I'm going to tell you about in a moment says, we're drawn to categorizations. Um, they simplify things without intention and common language. Self-awareness can feel like a funny house, like with a bunch of confusing mirrors that sort of, they give us a glimpse of the truth but it's like a distortion of the truth. So without having some kind of, of label, it's difficult to not feel like, you know, it helps us not feel like we're in that funny house. Number two, they validate us. Um, face validity is a powerful thing. Uh, things that make quick sense of our circumstances attract us. And if, if it makes me say, how did it know that about me? Um, it must be me. You know what I mean? So there's this like, it, it sort of, it, it validates us. They simplify us. Human beings are complicated and complex beings. Uh, we are made up of literally, I couldn't think of the right number, so I wrote kajillions. <laughs> we are made up of kajillions of different variables with traits being one of them. And anything that simplifies that complexity is probably attractive as long as it confirms our existing biases or may require less work. I don't wanna say just biases. If it confirms something that we say like, that's probably true. Um, and so it simplifies us. And if, it, if that's true, why do these same profiling tools or whether, however you want to refer to them, lexicons, this way of seeing the world, leave us wanting more? Why is the most common thing that we hear, we hear this all the time when we are talking about a whole person process? Because those of you that know what Wild Leaders does, that's what we do, a, a system for whole intentional leader development. One of the most common things that we hear over the years has been, so we use this tool and most of the people who used it in our, in our organization said, what's next? You hear what I'm saying? Like, it's like, what's next? What do we do next? We got started. What do we do next? We went on a weekend retreat and we used this particular inventory or assessment, or I read this, we read this book together that had these different profiles and it left us asking what's next. Now that I know my number or my color or, or this particular name and profile, what's next? And I think one of the, one of the reasons that we ask that is because we already know this. We are more than our personality, all right? And I'm going to tell you more about that in a second. So we're more than our personality. And each of these tools is getting at one portion of potentially at one portion of, of might be personality or behavior styles in an imperfect way, but it's, it's getting us there. And it does, I think anything that builds that awareness, as long as it has some validity is probably important. And it's interesting. So it means that like, even if, if these tools are really imperfect, that maybe like 99% of our self-understanding is still out there to be discovered. Like, that's why we ask, what's next? What's more? And if, if, if it's something that has some validation and it has some, some validity, then, then maybe what we know from research is that at least probably 60% of you is still out there to be discovered after this, this kind of one moment where we experience one way of seeing ourselves. And, and so... I want to do a side note to personality. It's not really a side note. I think there's a purpose for me telling you this, but I want to tell you, and some of you have heard me say this before over and over and over again, but as psychologists, as a psychologist, when I'm referring to personality, what I'm referring to is I'm referring to relatively stable traits. Do you hear me? That's important to note, relatively stable traits. And, and here's what's it, what you should be asked. Oh, I should be, I shouldn't, I should have you, and that's not really very motivating. So what I ask myself when McKenna says that is I say, how would you know if something's relatively stable? You know what I'm saying? Like if, if personality is relatively stable traits, how would you know if something is relatively stable? Well, here's some things from a research perspective. I'm not going to dive deep into this, but you would have to look across a lifetime or at least across a lot longer period of time to see whether things actually were stable. You would do empirical test construction based on populations of people who either did or did not show certain characteristics. That's like deep empirical test construction. So 
I could look at each of you and say, if you're if, look at a population and say, I know each of you, I know behaviors that each of you show. And then if I'm going to construct a test or an assessment of how you show up, I'm going to, I'm going to construct very items and questions that I know correlate with who you different you are. And so I might do that. Or, and then I would probably, then I, to go to my first point, then you would look at that across a person's lifetime. Do those things stand still in your life? Do they remain relatively stable? Uh, you might also, you build an assessment based on an existing theory, which by the way, most assessments are built that way. And then test it after the fact to see if the scales you've constructed hold up. Um, you could see if it correlates with existing assessments or something similar. Or you could just write a narrative and see if people see themselves in it. You know what I'm saying? So you could write a book. And so here's your different chapters. And each chapter of the book has a different profile. And you say, like, do people see themselves in it? And if they do, then obviously it's true. So that's, and that's face validity. So that's something that's interesting. And it's, it's, it, I think there's are different ways to go about doing that. So I got I to gotta dig a little deeper. because I was with my brother yesterday. And he's one of my primary mentors. He's a, um, I, he loves it when I call this out, but he's 17 years older than me. And, uh, and to have a brother like this, who is a differential psychologist, and he uh, just an amazing brain. And so we're, we're in the hospital yesterday, because my dad was having a procedure done. So we, I, get, I just, I, we dropped my dad off, my dad goes into the room, my brother and I have a conversation like this, one of those conversations Daniel was just talking about that most of you'd be like, Oh, my gosh, really? So we're, we're having this conversation. And, uh, and my brother's brain is just crazy, because my brother studied with, um, with Bouchard, who was, uh, Tom Bouchard was the guy who did the Minnesota twin studies. So that's who he studied. I don't know if the University of Minnesota, if you know about the twin studies, go read about them. I'm not talking about the baseball team. I'm talking about the twin studies. So fascinating personality work. And we were, and so when I was a, a pre-psychologist, that's a, that's a term I just had to create for this, like a pre-psychologist, um, my brother introduced me to, uh, to the California Psychological Inventory, the CPI. And, uh, and it's, it's been studied, like there's just mountains of research on the CPI. And what is, here, let me, let me tell you about the CPI for just a second. I'll tell you why I'm telling you. And uh, in my conversation with Doug, we're talking, I was like, Doug, tell me about, you were so into the CPI. Let, just remind me of some of that. And so the CPI is a basic two by two. Okay, so psychologists love two by twos. It's categorization, right? And so it's based on norm favoring there's two two dimensions on one dimension is norm favoring versus norm questioning are you with me someone who's like they like norms <laughs> like cultural norms group norms so on and there's other people that are norm questioning that's one of them so they're like question everything in terms of what the norms are then on the other dimension is introversion introversion and extroversion are you with me so this is what the cpi was based on really powerful psychological factors by the way relatively stable over a person's lifetime and you can imagine that, so you imagine the two by two, and then there were different labels for different parts of it, like norm favoring and, and high, high norm favoring and high extroverted tends to be a more dominant, it's called the alpha. So that's the alpha profile, it tends to be a little more dominant. You have introverted and norm favoring, which is the beta. You have norm questioning, which in the extrovert, which is the gamma. And then you have norm questioning and the introvert, which is the delta, which is also it, it's most extremes is sometimes where mental health sometimes comes into play because you have a person who's against a lot of things at, at, at sort of at the worst, but also is, is, is socially isolated. Do you hear me? So it's kind of fascinating. Well, here's what's so interesting is that, by the way, I got, by the way, I got to, this is a side note to, to this work. Um, and by the way, Tom Bouchard was mentored by Harrison Goff. So Doug meant my brother mentored by Tom Bouchard, Tom Bouchard mentored by Harrison Goff, who authored the CPOI, CPI at Berkeley. So it goes like this, this theoretical track and some of you are like, you are, I'm, my eyes are like crossing right now. I've stopped talking. So, so I tell you that because what's fascinating about extroversion alone is that extroversion in the CPI is multidimensional. Like some of the dimensions of it, I'm gonna tell you, it, it are self-esteem, social mobility, social fluency, and self-acceptance. And here's what's also interesting. I'm gonna say one thing about this, the self-acceptance variable what they found was that it is a U-shaped, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a U-shaped curve. And so the problem was, if you are, if you, as part of extroversion, if you are too self-accepting, it becomes narcissistic. Do you hear me? Like how many things out there talk about this, this reality that there's a reality that overdoing something like this, if we tell people like, accept yourself, accept yourself, accept yourself, we could push them over the top of something that is actually not helpful. So let me get back to that, get back to my two by two, because here's really why, I, this, that was a kind of a sidebar. Here's really why I wanted to explain the CPI. 
and why I was so taken by it back then. Imagine the two by two. There's a third dimension. Yes, I know, Becky. I know. There's a third dimension. And so actually imagine this, that it's more like a cube or like a, 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 a what do you call a rectangle? That's like not a rectangle, but it's multidimensional. It's a, I don't know. Somebody knows the name of it from geometry. So you've got this third dimension. And the third dimension was integration. So what this idea was at its highest level, imagine the two by two. So you've got the, the gamma, the alpha, the beta, the delta. And then you have this third dimension of integration, which is, which is real. It's, it's this someone who in that third dimension is someone who is exhibiting the best characteristics of that dimension best characteristics and at the lowest level someone who is not integrating which also relates by the way dr halleck to differentiation as i was talking to my brother about this like integration a lot of that's about emotional maturity like showing up as our best like thinking more systemically and how we deal with these high pressure moments so i tell you that because i why i loved it was it was giving a nod to something more complex and more whole that included i would even say the issues of good and evil the possibility that we could do bad things with good things. You know what I'm saying? Or, or that it's like, it's like this possibility that we all have something to be aware of in how we're showing up related to personality. Imagine that. So as Daniel said, I'm not going to say a ton about this, but he mentioned that we've done a lot of work on validity. I, it's um, something that I've been a part of. I, when someone, someone called over the years, would call me and say, hey, would you validate our instrument? And now think about this. This is someone typically who spent a million bucks developing a tool. And now they want wild leaders to validate and say that the tool measures what it says it measures because their clients are asking. And so the first thing I have always said to a person when they call is I have said, are you willing to have your tool be wrong? And most of the time they hang up because they spent a million bucks building this online platform that I can't have it be wrong. And I'm like, well, then you're not willing to do validation work on it. So to actually take a deep dive, and I've had two organizations that have said yes, actually there's been more than that. I shouldn't say that, but after the tool has been built, they said yes and said, we really want to do that work. And so I say that because if I'm going to approach labeling someone or validating a profile, I have to be very careful. I should be very careful. <laughs> I have to be careful because we're drawn to categorize ourselves and others. And while it's important, it can be reckless and not whole when we don't think about it as more whole. There's a lot of error in categorizations. And simplicity, it's interesting because simplicity is, I'm going to say more about this, but it's on the other side of complexity, not on this side of it. There's a quote from that I love from Oliver Wendell Holmes that my brother brought up yesterday. And the quote is this, Oliver Wendell Holmes, right? Supreme Court uh, justice and just a great thinker. For the simplicity on this side of complex, complexity, for the simplicity on this side of complexity, I wouldn't give you a fig. That means I wouldn't give you anything. <laughs> a fig, right? But for the simplicity on the other side of complexity, for that, I would give you anything I have. For the simplicity on the other side of complexity, I would give you anything I have. And it was interesting because my brother is now, he's now deep into the painting and drawing. And he said this interesting thing in art. He said, if you're drawing a face, you don't start by drawing the features. You start by drawing the skull. And what happens when you, it's, it's, he said, it's always about proportion and relationship. And he said, the problem with people when they start to do self portraits or they draw the face and they start with features, people typically draw the eyes way too big. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's interesting. You start with the whole and you start with that complexity, and then you, then you get to that level of specificity over time. And when we start with simplicity, we choose a piecemeal approach to our lives and the lives of others that is oftentimes, I think, lazy, incomplete, lacks humanity, and lacks the whole truth. That's why when people, it's, it's like, that's why that's that face thing. But when we start with the skull, we have that whole perspective. And when we start with the complexity and that whole story, simplicity does emerge. It's fascinating. Those of you who have used the wild toolkit, I was talking to my brother, I'm like, this is just, this is why this occurs. People will feel like Daniel Halleck threw them into the deep end. When we start building whole leaders, they'll be like, oh my gosh, you know, Josh Allred's like, oh my gosh, where are we going? But, you know, it's like, we're going to deal with all this. And Daniel's like, yeah, trust me. So we architect everything. So people understand this is going to be complex at first, but trust us. 
It's going to be complex. And then as people go through the process in year two, they begin to see simplicity out of the complexity. You know what I mean? They start to see pathways forward that they hadn't seen before. But if you start with the simplicity, we, we just left wanting more. And so I just, I want to say something about, so con, let's go to the, the um, I, as, a, as, a, as a psychologist, I got to admit, some of you think, I, some of you, I've actually been labeled recently as an assessment here. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, we're all about questions and assessment, but not for the sake of profiles, for the, for the sake of assessing where we are in a more holistic kind of way. And so, so thinking about profiles in the context of a narrative is what the Wild Toolkit is built around. That's why it's a powerful tool iterating over time. But, it, but it's, so I'm, not, I'm not an Enneagram hater, but I would say that sometimes we use tools like it in ways that counter other things that we know. And I'll tell you more about that in just a second. One of my friends, uh, Dr. Jeff Goldman is here. And I realized yesterday, I was like, oh man, Jeff back in the day did his dissertation on the Enneagram. And I, so I called him this morning and I was like, Jeff, don't light up my brain because I've got to be prepared for this wild conversation. And he said this, he said, when he was doing his dissertation, he said, he said this this morning and Jeff, you can't speak right now. You can go talk about it in your breakout if you want, but right now, buddy, you're muted. So he said this, so if I misquote you, but he said, there's not really nine types. There are more literally thousands of types. And he said, uh, it's so much more complex and really fluid. Context matters. Um, and he said, what I do love about it is that it's, it's, it's not static. So I know the intention is that not be static and that it can open up a new world of possibilities about the choices you make. And some of you don't go, don't even know what the Enneagram is. I don't even know if I want you to just go study it. I think, I think what I want you to, to pay attention to is like different assessment approaches is more about that. And so Jeff said these things and he was like, it was just interesting, right? Because he, he does, he sees the value in it, but we have to be careful because there's more complexity to be discovered. Why does it leave us wanting more? I think one thing is that, and I, I don't mean just the Enneagram, by the way, that's the bait and switch. You thought it was going to be all about this. I'm like, I think profiling and assessment in general, why does it leave us wanting more? Because typically it's not the whole story. Um, because it's, it also, I think sometimes it reinforces a fixed mindset. We have to be very careful about that. I'm going to say more about that in just a second before we finish. And I think the third thing is this, is that context is huge. I was talking to my brother yesterday. You know that the statement, the best predictor of behavior is past behavior? There is some truth to that, but here's what also is true that my brother and I were talking about under similar circumstances. Do you hear me? Like how powerful that becomes under similar circumstances. So context does matter. And as, uh, so, uh, so here are the things. So what do we do? Here's what I'm going to say. And we're going to have, we're going to link to an article. Claire will put that in the chat that, uh, we published in, in Talent Quarterly uh, regarding, it kind of was this, uh, uh, regarding the, Enne the Enneagram related to different profiling tools. So some of you may want to go check it out. It's a really simple read, by the way, so I hope you'll check it out. So what do we do? Here's the things that we do. One is change our language. Labeling our children, spouses, coworkers, or bosses as numbers or as colors or as animals <laughs> or as whatever, and leaving it there, I think is possi possibly reckless. And even according, this is, what, this is why I think that, please do not hear me as a hater. I, I don't, I'm not. I'm just, what I'm saying is that watch our language. This is the first point. Watch our language because we know from the great growth mindset research, those of you who are fans of Carol Dweck, is that if we label a person, we, we, by the way we speak to them, we reinforce a fixed mindset. People are so drawn to a fixed way of seeing themselves that we lose the possibility of the redemptive capacity that's around the corner developmentally. And I got to tell you, and some of you experienced this in the last year, even in the last few weeks, I've experienced moments where someone has come to me and said something to me, a very personal kind of thing where we've struggled in the past. They said something to me, and I would have bet my house they would not have had that conversation with me. People do change. Um, so be careful of our language. So I think I'd be cautious. I will, I will avoid, and I do it, I fail this sometimes, but I would avoid saying like, so you're a one, so let's understand that. You are not a one. I also would be careful to label people extroverts. I would say there's some, extra, you know, you have extroverted characteristics. So let's talk about how does that work itself out in different circumstances? I'm even careful with the validated instruments and how I speak. Number two, integrate traits and development, personality and context. It's kind of the same point, but it's the interaction between what's likely to change and, and not change that makes people so interesting. <laughs> 
The interaction, so to integrate traits and development is number two. Number three, see development as a process, as whole. The arrivals matter, but when we get there, we usually start again. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, that learning is like that. It's a mysterious and lifelong process of moments, motivations, inspirations, experiences, and learning that makes us so interesting as human beings. And then the, I want to add one that wasn't in the article. And this may be the only leadership principle that matters as, I'm, as, I, as I keep thinking about this. It's not all about me. And it's interesting how much of our cultural narrative is that it's about us. It's not just about how I label myself. It's not just about how you label yourself. When I was a kid, we didn't have our own phones. I know, Jen, we didn't have our own phones. You know what I mean? Like we shared a phone. I had to ask my parents before I got on the phone, are you on the phone? You know what I mean? Like now we all ha not only have our own phone, it's, that phone is all about us. And I just wonder what that artifact is telling us about what matters. And so I think that's one of the other things related to this. And so when we, when we built the wild toolkit as a whole leader development process, we built it around topics or titles that, you know, that were just would hopefully stand the test of time, but it also include that narrative. Like I said, we asked all Daniel was asked all the time, can the whole, a whole person process like the wild tool, toolkit what, work well with strength finder. And you know what we say, we say the wild toolkit plays well with other development components. As long as those, this other tool doesn't think it's the only kid in the playground. That's good, Brian, huh? You know what I'm saying? Like if that, if that tool is like everything, it's like, whoa, 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 there's like 90% still coming. So you better, as long as it's not the only kid there. So why does the Enneagram leave us wanting more? I think because there is so much more. And so don't hear me. Like, I think these are good. Don't hear me. If you love these tools, I think let's, let's use them responsibly. And let's also open this, that there's so much more to be discovered. And, and Claire will link to the, its article. So let's go crowdsource some wisdom in the wild conversation now together.